contributions in just about, uh, I think, every single area of our field. Uh, he's been extremely influential for good reasons, so I um, look forward to his talk today on uh, able tires and planes. Okay. Ha. Yes, and I have my time here as well. Well, the, the previous talk on the kinase was a, uh, a fantastic introduction, so I'll be probably be able to go a bit quicker at the beginning, since now you know everything about kinases. Um, so very often people show you the kinase, show you the catalytic domain, and of course there's more stuff. You know, like uh, there is the regulatory domain, like SH2, SH3. Most of the work I will talk about today is uh, without those domains, but it's important to keep them in mind uh, because anything we deduce about the conformation uh, of the catalytic domain has to be put back into the context of the full kinase. Some of these things can be phosphorylated that will affect you know, accessible conformation and things like that. So the dominant conformation, conformation change of the active, d of the uh, catalytic domain is basically the opening of the uh, uh, activation loop and rotation of the alpha C helix, which uh, is, was studied here by the uh, string method. And then we use this to do uh, potential of mean force. Remember the same thing, potential of mean force calculation. You go from the inactive state to a kind of active state, like, and this is not very, very high in energy. It's a bit higher. And this is done just on catalytic domain alone. If you do this, with the regulatory domain, you can see that actually the inactive, it's locked in the inactive and going to the active is gonna be very energetically difficult. And so this is like one of the uh, kind of context type of thing that you have to put back in, in the big picture. Uh, when you have these regulatory domains in the down-regulated form, what happens? We, we repeated that study actually, or in essentially that part of the study using Markov uh, models uh, which you, you are all familiar with by now. And this is a paper that, we, that was mostly led by uh, Diwakar Shukla and Yiling Meng uh, in collaboration with Vijay Pandey. And this, was, this is the motion of this activation loop again, and it's making a kind of a transition every 95 microsecond based on the sampling. And uh, if you map the Markov model in the same kind of coordinate I showed you before, this was umbrella sampling and this is the Markov model, I think I have here is like 350 microsecond against five microsecond of uh, replica exchange. So this is actually able to capture the general gist of it, even though this uh, has a broader exploration of our conformational space, but in, in large part, it's they're very consistent. So this was done on CSARC, which is one of the uh, main kinases. But as, you, as you've seen a bit earlier, like there's lots more kinases in the human kinome, and we're very interested in being able to understand uh, what's different about them. One kinase of great interest is a C-able kinase, which binds Gleevec. And if you focus on Gleevec, what you see is this famous DFG motif. This is DFG in, and then the DFG comes out, and now the Gleevec can bind. And so uh, the DFG in and DFG out is an important motif that affects the binding of these drugs. And this is only one motif, and uh, you just showed a bit earlier, uh, the alpha C and A loop. This is in green here, the alpha C. And, but there are other motifs, for example, the P-loop, which has a, munch, a bunch of possible conformation, which we tend to call like the extended one or the kinked one, the DFG motif. And the A-loop has a lot of conformations also, like sometimes it's a bit folded, sometimes it has an helix. Uh, so uh, in order to be able to characterize all the accessible conformation of the cathetic domain, we focus on these structural elements. And so uh, there was a comment a bit earlier, so this is, this is not an objective thing where we say, oh, let's just uh, take this protein and plug this into some sort of algorithm, and the algorithm will tell me what parts are interesting. Well, we didn't trust the algorithm. In fact, we had tried, and it couldn't even detect what was important or interesting in the structure. So we use the knowledge, to um, our knowledge, uh, to, to, uh, to try to categorize these structural elements in the different proteins, uh, in the different uh, state of ABLE, and so we make models that this is the able uh, bound with Levec. This is, and the blue bars are counting the number of, of uh, X-ray structures that were accessible to us uh, to populate the different states. And this alpha C could be in or out. When it's in, the kinase is active. When it's out, the kinase is inactive. You have the DFG can be in or out. You have the P loop can be kinked or extended. And you have the A loop as a, a few conformations. So you, we were able to tabulate, a, you know, 
about a bit less than 2,000 confirmations like that. Some of them, of course, able structure don't populate those states. And so we then resort on other non-able kinase to see if we can create models like that. And uh, the big question is always, what are you supposed to do? Like homology model has been around for a long, long time. Uh, and the old, uh, the old um, uh, word on the street by homology model is, is you just copy your coordinates and then don't touch it. That's the best model. You just, just copy the coordinate and just deliver that to whoever asks you the homology model. Don't minimize, don't run dynamics, don't do anything, don't do nothing. That's the best model. That's not really true anymore, but you know, it's, you still worry what these models mean. And so the, the context of Markov model perhaps gives you a bit of hope with that. It's like if you have a very long trajectory and you're able to you know, map all your states, you say, oh, now we're very happy we have Markov model. But because you know, these Markov models don't have memory, you could potentially start from one state and just watch you know, a, a, this green trajectory that by far does not explore all conformational space. So it's not really reversible, but that's fine because you get you start from this state and you have transition to this other state and and then so on and so forth. You know, you can add pieces of trajectory that starts from different things. And in principle, it's okay. In in practice, it's not really okay. I'm sure Greg could say more about that. Like you know, when you bias by which which way you start the trajectory, if you really have a real Markov model and you bias only by starting it in a bona fide Markov state, I think it would not be biased. But when you're doing this process, you don't know all the information. And when you start, you probably do bias it. In fact, adaptive biasing is, is one way to actually explore more things. And so you can affect a, a little bit the model with that. But nonetheless, this is, this is our philosophy. And so we, we created this, this um, kind of protocol in different points to build uh, the starting conditions for these, these models. So we say we're going to use all available crystal structures. And then we, we're going to also build homology models based on other crystal structures that don't look like the crystal structure we have. And so here you could use other kinases to put your able kinase in different states that are not uh, available for able. You can also make models that are not observed in any shape or form, but they just like uh, they do a piecewise uh, mixing of conformational variants. Like you could have a P loop that's kink with the DFG out and an uh, and, uh, alpha C that's in. And maybe there's no crystal structure like that, but maybe it's a feasible state of that. And so we constructed a lot of these things. We call them uh, the P, uh, let's see, I have them in the other slide here. Oh, we'll see it anyway. The PMCV, I think we call it the piece, or we call it actually, Yillian called them the Frankenstein model, basically. <laughs> it's like they're pieces of, of kinases that you sort of uh, harvested from the cemetery uh, somewhere. And then we found later, sort of the hard way, that actually we had to use also the string method to create physical pathway that link between different conformations that are uh, separated, but with very little intermediate states to start with. And so if you run long dy dynamics, the two whales just remain separate and they never communicate. And so we, we actually uh, seed our, our um, molecular dynamics by first doing a string method that connects the two bases and, and then start from that. Uh, if you look at, for example, the TDB structures, uh, you, you have, um, of course, some, some kinase of very low homology. We limited our models to above 30% homology. So that was uh, one of the things. This is just a slide with the TICA showing, actually. This is a, a general TICA, just to show that without the string method, there were lots of basin that were completely separate. And so we had to connect those things with, uh, with that. And in the end, we focus also on a feature uh, subspace that is really focusing on the structural elements that we know are important based on what everybody has been seeing with these kinases. So this is not like an a, um, a, a objective feature space that would say, like, I'm agnostic about the kinase. And we may probably miss, I'm sure we miss some important uh, conformational determinants somewhere in the structure because some of them maybe are not yet discovered. But without focusing the model on this, uh, it was very hard to actually get models that, that were converging and making sense. Um, the A loop is a bit of a mess because it's very large and flexible. And so we actually use uh, about 136 distances and then we did Tika on the A loop and use the first five Tika of that. So once you, uh, you take everything, we had like one, 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight plus five, about 13 dimensional space. That's the space we work in. And then when we do the, the clustering, uh, we did the clustering for every model. We did like five times with different lag times. We had 400 microseconds of aggregate data for, oh, I should say, we did twice actually. We did once where we rely only on the ABLE crystal structure, only that. And the other one, we do another set where we rely on everything but ABLE structures, as if there were, had never been a crystal structure of ABLE. So, so there's two sets. And uh, the, the, the number one question we wanted to answer with that is that, well, what if you're working on a kinase you've never had a crystal structure of? Or what, how good is that? And so we did a set where there's zero crystal structure available. Of course, it's hard to forget you've seen the DFG flip being important, so we, we still pay attention to things we know are important, but there's no literally crystal structure available. So we have 400 microseconds for each set. And uh, this is this general convergence. It's a bit messy, obviously. This is... Uh, the, you know, the, the, the eigenvalues with the different size of clusters and things like that. You can see that the, uh, when there's not enough clusters, we're kind of uh, faster on the time scale. The, the time scale starts to get a little slower. We capture slower time scale when the cluster is a little larger. Uh, but there's quite a bit of variance, you know, so this is not really so easy. Um, in the end, uh, we uh, we projected the entire results on the initial 16 sets that are known, so you get the list here. And uh, so there's two, let's see, there's, uh, there's three curves. So the, the blue curve is generated from the 400 microseconds of the uh, ABLE set. And these are the free energies of the 16 states. For example, this is the Gleevec bound state is the number, uh, is the number three here. You see, that's a... Um, the non-able abo able homology or non-able crystal structure is the orange and you can see it follows pretty much the same profile so that means that you know relatively speaking the free energy attributed to the two sets that are completely separate um, is, is fairly similar so that means that the sampling from one or the other is actually converge fairly well. If you combine the two sets, so that's like uh, the cyan line, that's now 800 microsecond of aggregate data, then that's, that's the line there. In a few places, the cyan line is below the orange line. Um, let's see. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm confused. Sorry. The, the orange, sometimes the, the cyan line is always sort of capturing the lowest free energy. That's what I mean to say. And for example here, the, the cyan line is lower than the blue. There was no able structure of that particular state, but there were homology models of other kinases. And so when you include those in your sampling, you do better. So you see the orange is just behind here. So you do better the same here. You see there is no able structure of that state, so the blue line is not that great, but actually the cyan and the orange is actually better. So actually relying on the homology model to augment your set actually makes it better. You can even compare the two results. The uh, yellow line here is when you actually make two homology models with no, no shared centers. So like sometimes when you want to compare two Markov models, you actually use the same microstate set to really um, have a match one-to-one -one with everything. But in the real world, you would not have at your disposal a, a, a set of microstates from able crystal structure. So we really did it. Uh, without any knowledge of the uh, able structures, even in the microstates, and you can see that again the pattern of free energy is, is maintained. So that's very encouraging. You know, that means that when you fold that back onto you know the, the kind of crystal structure or states that that uh, structural biologists have seen, it's kind of making sense. Now, when we did that, Yilin was working at the University of Chicago and getting crystal structure from the PDB, but we collaborated with PPI from from people from Eli Lilly. And of course, at Eli Lilly, they have more crystal structure available. In fact, they, they have hundreds of them. And uh, one of the states that we had, had found for ABLE is the state 16. And you can see here, this is the green histogram. These are only Eli Lilly structures. There is no PDB structure with an ABLE in that, that conformational state. The red one is the one that comes from the PDB. So there's, you know, sometimes they have many more, but there's a few in the PDB that was enough. 
This one, there was zero. And so we, we, uh, we compare our social model from their crystal structures. It took a while to go through all the legal hoops to get them to release this, but finally it's actually in the PDB. Uh, and so, and you can see there's actually two structures here. You can barely see that there are two structures. They are almost identical. It's quite remarkable. So that's, a, that's kind of a, of a win. In, in a way, that means that the calculation is able to predict that one, one structure of Abel would be a genuinely, perfectly at, uh, a nice structure for Abel. Now, you could have done that also from homology with another kinase, but in that case, you never really know. It's like, should I trust my homology model or not? Well, here we know that the free energy of that state is perfectly valid. One thing you can do also is use all this data to uh, collapse back or project that back onto the subspace of the conformational variant. For example, we've seen earlier the DFG motif. So um, we could project it on, on uh, you know, uh, collective variables that are used directly in the model, but the Markov model was built with these kind of distances. So this, these are the distances we use directly in the Markov model. You can see the, um, the uh, uh, pink triangles is where a bunch of crystal structures are. So it's kind of interesting that um, you see here also, so this is the DFG out, uh, one IEP, that's the Gleevec bound structure, that's the black dot. There's a few, these are the DFG in. What you can see is that very often the crystal structure is not far from the, the, you know, the blue uh, region, which is the low free energy, but not quite, quite there. And uh, what I suspect, this could be, could be two things, could be inaccuracy of the force field, that means that our, um, our mo dominant or most uh, uh, stable conformation of the DFG is not quite the same as the X-ray structure, but you have to also remi uh, remind yourself that our dissimulation here are done in the APO state. There's no ligand because we, we didn't want to bias anything towards any ligand, whereas this crystal structure has Gleevec bound. So, so it could be that actually this is the genuine, if this was the real God-given free energy map, you could say, well, you know, the, the, the ABO without the ligand is here, and then when you bind the ligand, you have to shift a little bit the minimum. And that's kind of a, a slight part of induced fit when you bind the drug. It's not quite just a, a, you know, a, a, a conformational selection. There's a slight part that is induced. Fit. There's also some strange conformation that are highly populated, and they are not registered at all as being uh, uh, you know, observed in crystal structures. So those are potentially very interesting. Uh, the P-loop is also... Here it's even more striking. You see, like there's some crystal structure are really not in the lowest free energy region, and so there's like several conform. We call it extended or kinked, but in fact there's really three states of the P loop. That's even four. The P loop is a bit complicated, and it's important because if you have very long drugs, it will actually uh, bump into the drug. It's at the end of the pocket, so that's an important one. Um, this is the same map as you've seen before from the. Uh, so this is the inactive state, and this is the movement of the loop, and this is the rotation of the alpha C, and this is the active-like state. You see there's also crystal structure in the active-like state. This is the inactive state. Uh, this is when the DFG is in, which is the same thing we had done with VG and we had done uh, with uh, umbrella sampling in the past. You can do the same map when the DFG is out, actually, and then the map is very different. You know, it has nothing to do. And so then... Uh, it's hard to tell exactly what will happen, you know, with these conformations, which one should be, uh, uh, you know, the most, uh, the most populated. One thing about ABEL that's very interesting also is um, it can bind a, a, uh, a chain, a, a kind of a lipid chain, that t and it, it turns it into an inactive, and you can see it here. And when this is bound there, allosterically, it also kind of inhibits the kinase. And so we were monitoring a distance that tells you the, um, the uh, opening of this allosteric binding pocket. That's along D8 here, this distance. And when the pocket is very open, you can be in DFG in or DFG out. But when the pocket is a bit smaller, you can't go back to DFG out. You're stuck here. So, so there is a coupling between the DFG, uh, uh, which is along this D4 axis, and this allosteric. And so the allosteric binding site, so that's probably not the, so th almost feel like uh, this is like your, your own talk. We've seen this before. So uh, this is a, D a, a DFG flip, a spontaneous DFG flip that happened during our aggregate simulation. The, uh, the D is not protonated here. So this is like, uh, this is the one, uh, this is one of the hard one to see actually. Um, 
We saw it only once, and this was in a, a few phases of reseeding back the trajectory from you know adaptive sampling and everything. So it's a genuine flip, but it's not something we've seen a lot. Uh, if we run a stochastic trajectory based on our best MSM with the 800 microsecond of data, the DFG flip is nastily in almost the millisecond time scale, according to the Markov model. Now, people could say this is impossible because you can't trust that. I'm not sure that I trust that, but certainly it's a pretty slow motion, for sure. Um, so the next thing that we want to do is also now start to analyze the metastability of those states, because we can see them in the free energy map, but is how much of those states are really uh, uh, metastable. So this is work that uh, Fabian Paul has been doing in the lab since he just, just uh, joined us about a couple of months ago. And uh, this is a PCCA analysis. And you can see about 23 states that have long time scale in his uh, PCCA analysis. And uh, here I'm going to just quickly map them back. Uh, so this is the same distances for the, um, this is the inactive kinase, this is the active kinase. And these are like the metastable states he detects. The losange here is the crystal structure. So the rounds are actually the core of the metastable state. And if you put the, the full region on it, you can see where these things are lying uh, according to the, uh, the trajectories that he's been running. Um, this DFG out also that I showed you. So this is the, uh, you know, the A loop and the alpha C helix. And when the DFG is out, it's, the map is more like a mess. You know, you, you, the confirmation don't look the same anymore. Um, which one is this? Oh, this one. This is the P loop. Yeah, this is the P loop. I should have put that somewhere. Yeah, this is the P loop. Um, so again, there are crystal structures in different places. And there's some metastable states around here that clearly are not explored by the, uh, the crystal structures. And so that, and this is the, the, the Ah, yeah. And of course, this is the Gleevec bound. So this is the P-loop when the DFG is out. And this is the confirmation I was pointing uh, out on the PMF before, basically, which is not seen in crystal structure, but should be metastable, according to that. And so that's kind of interesting, too. So to finish, the important point, I think, and, it, you know, we're, we're kind of modest users of this technology now, and uh, when it sort of um, fails in our hands, we're a bit embarrassed, but we'd like to be able to use it. And so here we, we know the system. The kinase is something that we've studied. So we know the system. Crystallographers and you know, medical chemists and people have studied these systems. So they, they've pointed us in the right direction in what to pay attention to. So most of the analysis that we do is based on the structural macro states that we can almost guess. What are the conformational variants, the PU, the DFG? We don't have to discover those. And we pay attention to that. Um, the question is, are these structural macro states that actually are observed in crystal structures with a bound drug, are they genuine metastable states that you would find in an APO simulation? Assuming the force field is not a problem, so that's a different question, but if the force field is good enough, is an apokinase visiting these states that recapitulate the states that you see when drugs are bound? So that's a, I mean, that's a valid and legitimate question. I think we're beginning to see that many of those states are truly metastable, even without the drug. So that's kind of nice. Um, and so we're able to, I think we're beginning to show that we're able to discover those metastable states just from the Markov model without knowing them. The big question is, could we define the proper, or could we discover the proper subspace of features without the knowledge that was given to us by the crystallographers? I'm not sure. I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I mean, like, the first time we did that, we used a bunch of distances, you know, the R spine, the, uh, the hydrophobic spine, the ALU. We just put like a bunch of distances, put that in TCO. You get like a bunch of uh, markers, you know, your, t your tick one, tick two. It didn't even know what was a DFG fit. Like you, it would cluster things without even knowing what was the DFG fit, even though we had put these distances in there. So it was blind to it. So, you know, it's, it's, so it, I think that sometimes this, to me, this, is, this point is the biggest challenge computationally, is that 
to be able to actually have an analysis that's agnostic. I'm not sure we're there. And I, I would like people to be lucid, frank, and candid about that problem, because it is really a big problem. And it's not always the case. Um, and then the, the last thing is, you know, when you talk to people in the drug industry and people do this in, in tests and tumors and everything, you have to remember that, well, you know, you can do all the calculations you want on the catalytic domain, but if you don't have the regulatory domain, you don't know the phosphorylations. Like, Gleevec binds to ABLE when ABLE is phosphorylated also in the tumor. And that's not in my simulation. And that affects the confirmation a lot. So, you know, some of these things, I mean, you, maybe you want to simulate with phosphorylation, maybe, but it starts to grow quickly. You know, you'd like to be able to infer meaningful information without having to simulate all possible states of everything. That's a lot of work. And so, but that remains a big question, this last point. This is more like a kind of a common sense thing. And, and so, I'd like to just finish quickly to acknowledge the, the work. Our collaborator at Eli Lili, Michael Veet, and uh, uh, Chen Gao. Um, oh, the name of the crystallographer is not there. Uh, <laughs> he was on the slide. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but David. Yeah, let me just quickly. I mean, it's, that's too embarrassing. No, but I thought his name was there. Let's see. David Clausen, I should remember. David Clausen, Eli Lee, you got me, yeah. So, um, and um, yeah, we, we benefited from a lot of help from many people. And uh, I thank you very much for your attention. And so you said if you don't handpick your distances, yeah. um, you could not converge the model and so on, right? And then you only pick the five, six, and so on. Well, actually, it's a bit worse than some model would converge. It's just that the model didn't know about the DFG fit. OK. That's but a little bit of a problem. With, with this entire handpicking mechanism, what makes you think that you actually have connected all your structures? You've over-projected massively all your dynamics on these biotics. What makes you think you just haven't built an MSM on a very over-projected space where you think you connect things, but they're actually And B, what makes you think these free energies are meaningful in any way? Because you get this kind of chimera of uh, over-projected structural distances with some kind of over-projected denial. <coughs> what does that actually mean? Are these true dynamics? Yeah, what, what you're telling me is that, you know, okay, so if I can raise the issue of having a bad subspace where I can see that the states are disconnected, and then that's clearly, it's a glaring problem because the states are disconnected. And then you say, well, but then I hand pick something, and then somehow now I look at it and say, oh, now it looks like they overlap, and it's fine, but in reality I'm deluding myself because in fact these states are, well, that's a problem with anything you do. I mean, like, that that's will always be there. Um, you know, uh, what we did is every, we, we have the aggregate data, and we repeat the analysis several times with the same aggregate data, different clustering algorithm, different lag time. You know, you can, you can you kick at it a lot. And if everything comes out always qualitatively to tell you the same message, you know, it's, it's basically it's beginning to say that it's converging to that. Now, maybe it's converging to the wrong message, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a pessimistic by nature, but I, I'm skeptical, but I'm not pessimistic. I think if you kick at it enough and you repeat the analysis with you know different stochastic uh, clustering uh, starting point, et cetera, and everything is always beginning to be consistent, then I, I begin to feel like I, uh, you know, in many of those articles, we were able in the past to do umbrella sampling on those things. And many of those PMF look the same when we did umbrella sampling. So, you know, they don't, they're not particularly shocking. They're not particularly uh, surprising. Yeah. Was a there was a question over there. Yeah. Yes, yes, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, Benoit, you had this one um, free energy map of the P loop, I believe. Yeah. Where you had this extra structure that was kind of off. Yeah. Have you gone back and checked the extra structure if it was a real one or that is there electron density or is this just a weird model of, model by the crystallographer? 
Oh, the, the, the blue whales that we had? No, no, you had this one extra structure that was in a high energy region of the pillow. Oh, think. yeah, 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 yeah. And you wonder if it's disordered or... No, I just wonder if, if you really can see it in the extra structure or if it's just a weird model that the big crystallographer built. It's, it's possible, you know, I mean, like, I'm, I'm not a devotee of crystallographer uh, uh, worship, but, you know, I, mean, I, I can, I would think that the P-loop is not disordered, but I, we could look. The A-loop is often a mess, for sure. The A-loop is often even missing. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to follow up on, uh, in the interest of full transparency, I think Rafa was hinting at the fact that we've done the experiment that we uh, described here, where you start with large models with highnesses and run, in our case, with 10 times more data unfolding at home. And we found them to be completely disconnected whenever we worked hard enough. So I, I'd be really interested in trading data sets to see if we can actually figure out if they are really connected or disconnected. Because I think this is a big problem in, in the field of building Markov's table. Well, how many, how many features you use? Uh, we used, we, we could always find features that separated them. So if we overproject what Rafa suggests, then it looks like they're connected. No, I, I'm very heartened by your showing that you can use two different sets of data and get similar free energy. So I think that's a really good uh, suggestion that it might actually be connected. But um, we would always find a way to find them to be disconnected if you look hard enough. Right. But well, you don't use the stream method to connect things. We, didn't use the stream method. we often, have, without that, we definitely add more problems. Well, definitely. The last question. Uh, yeah. yeah, this is something interesting to think about. You know, a lot of these, a lot of these experimental methods, like NMR relaxation dispersion, right? It, um, it, you know, uh, underlying kind of this Markov model of states, but NMR will tell you that it's a transition between two states. But the, what the state could not, might not be one actual structure, which experimental think it is. It could be a, a sub ensemble of states. Um, you know, you, you could have sets of of of, of macro states. Um, that that interconvert on a certain um, um, time frame, and it, that's just how it how it's projected in the experimental um, um, I experimental uh, uh, data. I talked about this mm -hmm. in, with with uh, Jeff Palm and Pin One WW which would be nice. Yeah, you know, might be a nice example to really blast out because um, you know you know there you had basically um, if, if you fit using the um, the NMR data, you would have su a, a subset um, of macro states in, in one sort of global state and another and another um, and rest in another global state and these interconverted on a certain time frame and that gave good agreement with the um, with the uh, NMR chemical shift data. And so there's you know the, the, the experimental data also is there is 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 a projection as well of the, of the fundamental thing. That's something we have to we have to reconcile. Anytime we're trying to agree with the experimental data, you know, there is some fundamental projection going on. Yeah. Yeah. You were always working, I mean, uh, my brain works maybe in three-dimensional space, perhaps, <laughs> maybe four sometimes, but <laughs> above 13 or 14 dimensional space, I have a hard time thinking. So it's very hard to perceive. And there's some, some inherent problems that are growing so fast with high dimensionality that, you know, it's even hard to conceive what's going on sometimes. But, I, you know, that's why I said this point here, that... My, you know, define the proper subspace and really have like a diagnostic to see why this is correct. I think this is like the, it's the deal breaker. You know, the formalism is quite developed by now, and there's lots of tools to do many things. But that thing is uh, is is still like a the deal breaker in my head. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Let's thank